Section 1. You will hear the secretary of a social club telephoning a tourist information office to get information for a group visit to the town of Tidborough. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, this is Tidborough Tourist Office. Derek speaking. How can I help you? Good afternoon. Um, my name's Clara Swift. I'm the secretary of a social club and we're planning a visit to Tidborough? Oh, yes. So, I'd like to ask you some questions, if I may, to help with our plans. Of course. We're here to help. Now, we're thinking of staying in the youth hostel, as we'll be a group and it's quite cheap. Yes, and comfortable too. But could you tell me how far outside the centre it is? Oh, it's not too bad. It's only one kilometre from the station, which is very convenient, and two kilometres from the very centre of town. Now, there's a frequent bus service. That doesn't sound too bad. Actually, I've tried phoning them but had no reply. Ah, you can check out everything you need to know if you go to www.cheapstay.com. That's their own site. It's quite new. And you could email them with your requirements directly from it. Well, that sounds good. Thank you. We'll be staying in the third week of March. Will there be any special events going on then? Er. Uh... Yes, that includes the 22nd, doesn't it? Good. That's when the street festival is held. It's great fun. Lots going on. It's held every year. OK. And uh, when that's finished, uh, if you've any energy left, you and your group might enjoy a concert we're putting on. Is it classical music or rock? Well, quite a mixture, actually. The point is that it's all performed by local musicians, and uh, between them, they'll be playing most things. It sounds a little strange, but I guess it could be interesting. It seems we've chosen a good week to come. <laughs> is there anything else on? Oh, yes, indeed. The City Museum, which was recently completely restored, often has interesting exhibitions. There are some weird and wonderful modern paintings at the moment. That's a good exhibition. Then, uh, opening on March the 24th, when you'll be here, it changes to natural history. I'd recommend it. Oh, I've made a note of that. Now, some of our group are quite young, and they may prefer to do things that they feel are more active than walking round museums and so on. Uh, what will they be able to do? Ah... Throughout March, in fact, the sports centre is going to be closed. Uh, but the swimming pool will remain open, and there's the park for general relaxation. That sounds all right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And uh, were you planning to go on any excursions while you were here? Yes, I was going to ask you. I gather there's a very picturesque train journey out along the coast? The Beach Express. Yes, it's lovely. It's an old-fashioned train. Not an express at all, in fact. But it chugs along, giving you marvellous views. Does it go often? No, it's just a tourist special, really, but it sets off in the morning at 9.30, and it's very popular, so I'd get there no later than 9.15 if I were you. The station opens at 9, so you can get a coffee or something while you wait. It sounds lovely. And for tickets? Well, as I say, it may be crowded at the station, so it's probably more convenient to get them beforehand from us at the tourist office. 
The youth hostel may sell them too. You'd have to check that. OK, I will, thanks. How much are tickets? Five pounds, although students get 20% off. And if there are more than ten of you travelling together, you get 15% off. So it's very reasonable. Yes, that's not too bad. And is it a long ride? Uh, not really. I think it's about three hours actually in the train. You'll be back for lunch about four hours later. It stops twice for half an hour so you can stretch your legs, have a little stroll on one of the beaches. I see. Well, you've been very helpful. Thank you. Not at all. I hope you enjoy your visit. Contact us any time. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a director of Hawkins, a large department store, giving an introductory talk to a group of temporary staff on their first day at the company. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 13. Hello everybody and welcome to Hawkins. I very much hope you will enjoy working here and indeed that some of you may take the opportunity to join our permanent staff. Now my purpose this morning is to give you a short overview of Hawkins and a few pointers about working here. Then I'll hand over to Celia, Head of Human Resources, to begin the training proper. Right, now we've seen quite a mixed history in sales recently at Hawkins. Five years ago, we saw the beginning of a success period, as sales climbed at an exciting rate, but then they went flat again for a few years, although we're delighted that they've recovered in the last year to rise again, so the future looks bright. As a company, we have to watch and be proactive about where these sales are coming from. All of you here will be allocated to different departments, but you may be interested to know where your area stands in relationship to others. Hawkins was traditionally basically a clothing retailer, and clothes remain an important part of our business, but over recent years we've seen that reduce as food and electrical have both grown, leaving us equally balanced on all fronts at the present time. This is a situation we'd be pleased to maintain, although the general increase in food spending is predicted to affect all major players in our sector. Well, that's us. What about you, as temporary staff? Where do you fit in? Any business that operates in a changing climate must rely heavily on contributions from a flexible proportion of its staff, and Hawkins is no exception. Last year, we recruited temporary staff into every department, and this year we've done that again, actually increasing the numbers, and we expect to take on an even higher proportion next year. So, you'll be playing an important part in our success. Before you hear the next part of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 19.
Now listen and answer questions fourteen to nineteen. We regard the Hawkins approach to the retail business as something special. Our mission statement, the guiding idea behind everything we do, is based on quality, and is phrased "creating value for customers." And this belief applies to every customer and every purchase, however large or small. Happy customers means good business for us, and your main aim must always be to keep customers happy. If any kind of problem or complaint arises, don't try to resolve it yourselves or simply leave it to a colleague, but get the assistance of your line manager. It's his or her responsibility to sort it out. A properly resolved problem will mean we get a loyal customer for life, and that's why we need to make sure that everyone who shops here feels they have had a positive experience, not just a routine transaction. We like to remind customers that everything we sell in Hawkins is high quality. It's the basis of our advertisements. But keep customers informed. Let them know about special offer products. To keep yourself up to date about these and all the other aspects of the company, please look carefully through the newsletter that we publish each month. And something else you'll need to do regularly is to talk with your section supervisor. And you do this in your progress meetings, which will be every Thursday. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at question twenty. Now listen and answer question twenty. Right, just a few things, and then I'll hand over. I think you were all asked for details of your certificates when you filled in your initial application form. Can you make sure that you provide the human resources office with copies of them by the end of the week? There's a pile of information videos on the table at the back there, and I'd like you to take one each. And please make sure you watch it carefully when you get home this evening. It contains lots of important facts and advice. Will you also pick up your security pass by the end of the day from the office on the fourth floor, as you'll need it to get in tomorrow? Don't forget you'll need it to obtain your staff discount when you make any purchases. Okay, that really is it from me. So now, Celia, if you'd like to take a. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear two students, Brian and Emily, talking about penguins, the subject of their current assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. So, Brian, how have you been doing with your reading on penguins? Not too bad, Emily. And you? Yeah, okay. I hadn't realised there were so many differences between the various types of penguin. No, nor had I. Anyway, I started with the Gen Two. And me with the Rock Hopper. And it turns out they're rather cautious. <laughs> Not scared of swimming, I trust. <laughs> oh no, but they don't like going about at night. Scared of the dark, I suppose. 
and if they're climbing over some rocky landscape, they'll only jump if they have to, and even then they'll look carefully down and spend time deciding whether to or not. Is that common? I don't think so. The rock hopper will have a quick look if it's somewhere they haven't dropped down before, but they don't seem timid. In fact, they're pretty determined. And if they're trying to get up somewhere, they grip onto the stones with their slightly hooked bills as well as their nails when the surface gets very steep. Nothing stops them. Interesting, because the other type I looked into, the Magellanic, tend to stick to the beach rather than going inland. So you see them walking along with their flippers at their sides or a bit forward. If they come across something they haven't seen before, they cock their head first to one side, then the other. Peering out of each eye in turn, as if they don't quite believe anything until they've double-checked it, and then, when they call to each other about anything, they arch their backs strangely first before making a very loud noise indeed. Oh, because the king penguin stands very upright when it calls, and they have the longest flippers, which they hold towards the ground as if they're worried about falling over. But it's quite dignified too. I think they're my favourite type. Uh huh. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to twenty-seven. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-five to twenty-seven. Anyway, there are some things that they all do the same, aren't there? Oh yes, eating fish, for example. Well, of course, <laughs> but sleeping, say. Yes, occasionally you might see one stretched out flat in the sun for a snooze. But normally you see them standing at night, even though they're sound asleep. It seems odd, doesn't it? And then they're all liable to get aggressive if they feel invaded, aren't they? Yeah, not quite so sweet then. <laughs> And with the rock hopper, the one with the distinctive black and yellow feathers on its head. That's the one. If it gets annoyed about something, then the black feathers on the head point upwards, and the yellow feathers stick out. It all makes it look bigger or tougher. I wonder how often they get annoyed. Well, I don't know about annoyed, but they've plenty to get frightened of. They've got predators in the water, and on land. Well, in the sky anyway. Oh yes. The great skewer bird. It's after the eggs. So the penguins have to keep a careful watch for the skewer all the time, especially when they're nesting. They can spot the white patches in its wings, can't they, as one flies over? Yes, and then they sit very closely on the eggs to protect them. Not an easy life, really. No. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. So, what else have we found out? Well, I was interested to see that although they nest individually, they always go into the sea together in large numbers. Even though it might make them more obvious to predators. That's the price to pay for the best way to find food. It means a bigger catch from each trip. I see. I watched a video too, just showing them on the beach. And I was struck by how calm they seem to be. I thought they might have looked frightened. Perhaps it's because there are so many of them. Maybe that gives them a sense of security. In fact, all the types have a social nature.、Mm. I guess that's why we humans find them so fascinating to observe. I guess so. So, shall we start to put all our notes together?、Mm. And then I think we ought to. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about issues involved in the management of the growth of cities. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now, a key issue in the ability of cities to grow is the question of housing. However, quality is as important as quantity here. But that isn't to say that this is easy to guarantee, and the development, or at least the spread, of many modern cities is marked by the sprawl of slum or shantytown housing. Governments are, of course, keen to address this, but the tendency to demolish them has often proved disastrous, as it doesn't solve the problem unless satisfactory replacements are ready for the inhabitants. What I'm saying is that suitable housing projects have to be lined up to accommodate these otherwise displaced people, and suitable is the key word here. All too frequently, there isn't real consultation. Only token gestures. If the residents aren't fully involved, they are unlikely to find the resulting development appropriate to their needs. People need to feel reasonably independent, and strategies for providing accommodation schemes work much better if an approach rooted in self-help is applied. People value things more when they have been part of bringing them into being. At the same time. Residents can't do everything for themselves, or not well enough anyway, and so governments need to accept that a number of services will always have to be laid on. These would include electricity and water, and so on. From the other side, residents need to feel able to commit. Migrants are essential to the growth of cities, bringing rapid increases in population, skills, and income. But they need to have a sense of security. Of long-term commitment to the city, if they are to invest money in building or buying houses, developing this sense of commitment isn't straightforward, and it takes time. It's complex and involves several factors. People need to feel they belong, and unfortunately, too many governments fail to appreciate that community values are a crucial component of that. Sadly, there are too many housing schemes which don't work. People drift away, or the whole place becomes crime-ridden. It's easy to be wise after the event, but it is worrying that a lot of housing is put up without analysis having been carried out to examine how much employment is going to be available for people. But I don't want to labour the negatives too hard. Such difficulties as there are are challenges, and challenges that can be and often are overcome. And cities are, I believe, a good thing. Urbanisation, the process of developing cities and the societies that comprise them, may not be everyone's dream, but it has a huge impact on the economy and also benefits each and every person's freedom. Furthermore. The sheer volume of people means that work can be differently distributed. In villages, people need to be multi-skilled in order to be autonomous, but in cities, you can see the evolution of a variety of specialist activities, and this means people live in a more sophisticated way. It's not only tangible phenomena; there are all sorts of other equally important benefits too. Residing in cities. Brings us face to face with many different ways of thinking or going about things, and this increases our degree of understanding. Something which is hard to measure in scientific terms, but which surely makes better people of us all. Right. Well, now I'd like to turn our attention to the suburb. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thanks for watching. Here are other two videos. You can watch them as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed my channel, please subscribe it and hit the bell icon for my upcoming videos and share these all videos among your friends.